Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for having me here in this uh, series of Jib Talks. This is, I think, the event's uh, fifth edition. So many congratulations to Julian, Seamus and the Cultural Services team for putting all this together. I do hope these sessions continue for many years to come. So now on to the small matter of Brexit. <laughs> I think the, su the subject matter of the talk today will take nobody by surprise. Brexit is something that has rocked Gibraltar to its foundations. And, and the United Kingdom too. And also the European Union. I intend to look at Brexit in the context of the wider love-hate historical relationship between Britain and Europe. A relationship that was fueled by a different perspective of the world and of the UK's position in it. The demands of a global empire, the trade, military, political links that bound the United Kingdom to a quarter of the planet. The view that the UK was one entity, separate and distinct to the continent that lay across the channel. Still regarded by many there as a strange place where people speak French and German instead of English. Where in one country they fight and kill bulls. In another, they eat snails. In another, they have had 61 governments since the end of World War II and where all in all they have much to learn from us about democracy. That is, of course, an exaggeration, but it is nonetheless an underlying attitude. So where did it all start? I'll begin with a quote, which was, in effect, a caution or a warning. Unless a clear view is pushed that Britain must lead in Europe, at, at the very least to achieve the completion of the single market, then the portmanteau for Greek Euro exit might be followed by another word, Brexit. Many of you might not know this, but this was the first time that the word Brexit was published. The date was the 15th of May 2012, just over six and a half years ago. It was coined by a gentleman named Peter Wilding, the founder and now managing director of UK-based consultancy, The Influence Group, six and a half years ago. Today, I almost do not remember what I used to do before the referendum. I cannot recall the last time I went through an entire day without hearing the word Brexit or reading the word Brexit somewhere. And I dread that for the foreseeable future, that word will continue to resonate in every household, in every school, in every office, and in every conversation in Gibraltar. Mr. Wilding may have been the first person to, to coin this issue, to coin the word Brexit. But whether we like it or not, the word is now inextricably linked and woven into the fabric and the history of our community. However, the reality is that Brexit as a concept, as a debate, as a perennial question, has existed for many decades. So let us go back one moment to the beginning. What is now Brexit was, at one time, let's call it Brentry. The same fundamentally British concerns over the UK's exit from the European Union expressed today were voiced upon presentation of the European project back in the 1950s. The UK was different to the continent in ideology, in constitutional makeup, in ethos, in attitude, in the way of doing things. Britain, an island, was said to be closer to its kinsmen in Australia and New Zealand on the far side of the world than it was to Europe. Euroscepticism existed even before Britain joined the EU. As far back as 1950, the then Labour Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin, upon contemplating whether there should be a Brentry or not, foresaw this, and I quote, once you open that Pandora's box, all sorts of Trojan horses are going to fly out. And he was not mistaken. Eventually, though, the UK decided that it would be best to join what was then the European Economic Community. The UK saw the countries on the continent as economic partners, as opposed to anything else which might imply a closer political or human affinity. So for one reason or another, it was time to join. 
but the process was not going to be an easy one. Five of the six members of the EC were ready to embrace a difficult United Kingdom with open arms. France was not. Charles de Gaulle, as you know, the legendary French president who played a pivotal role in the development of the EEC. And it was France that vetoed UK entry into the Continental Club. Not once, but two times. First in 1963, and then in 1967. De Gaulle accused the UK of having a deep-seated hostility to the European project. London, he said, had shown a lack of interest in the common market. The United Kingdom, he declared, was incompatible with Europe. He was not wrong. The Iron Lady Margaret Thatcher herself conceded that President de Gaulle had it right all along. She said in Statescraft that de Gaulle did not particularly like Britain, but he understood the British quite well. But for Thatcher, the differences between Britain and the continent run deeper than misconfigurations of economic policy. She was adamant that it was Britain's long history of continuous constitutional development, the respect in which her institutions were held, the honesty of her politicians and the integrity of her judges, the fact that not since a Norman conquest had she known occupation that neither Nazism nor communism had ever gained grip in her political life. All these things, said Thatcher, marked Britain aside and apart from the continent. Be that as it may, the UK and indeed Gibraltar joined the European communities in 1973. The UK's entry into Europe proved to be as controversial then as its exit is proving to be today. Europe has continued to inform and dominate UK politics since 1972. It has also been a source of division. Indeed, already by 1975, the first UK-wide referendum was held on the, UK, the United Kingdom's continued membership of the European community. This was only three years after going in. Upon, upon taking power, Harold Wilson promised to firstly renegotiate the terms of membership, and secondly, to put that renegotiation to the people of the UK in a referendum. It all sounds so familiar today. That was the same offer that David Cameron was to repeat in 2016. The result of the 1975 referendum was a landslide. On 64.5% turnout, more than two-thirds of UK voters voted to remain. In the 2016 referendum, as you all know, the outcome was very different. But these are the cards that have been dealt to us. And we all know well what the future, what, what Brexit could mean for Gibraltar in the future. And we all know the intensity of the ongoing work to ensure the smoothest possible jib exit. But rather than bore you with those same issues which we've repeated at nauseum inside out, I want to speak to you today about what Brexit has meant for me personally. Pressure, stress, hard work, patience, resolve, persistence, perseverance, responsibility, I could go on and on. But those are some of the first words that came into my head. There is also no magic recipe. We all know exactly what we're up against. The gauntlet was thrown down very early on. You will recall that within, within hours of the referendum result being announced, Mr. Margallo, then the foreign minister of Spain, said that the Spanish flag on the rock is much closer than ever before. But the Spanish flag remains today exactly where it always was, firmly planted on the other side of the border. And that is where it is going to stay. The, The other images that come into my head are meetings, flights, <coughs> nights away from home, nights away from my family, my wife, my children, London, Brussels, Strasbourg, Madrid, Madrid, Brussels, Strasbourg, London, 
the meetings have proved incessant and it has been genuinely and truly quite exhausting. Although curious, curiously in this day and age, you would not believe how much diplomacy can actually be done by WhatsApp. <laughs> we, we, we call it digital diplomacy <laughs> and it helps. You cannot imagine the revolution that can be orchestrated in a matter of seconds, no matter where you happen to be in the world. But I'm afraid you will have to wait for my new book to learn more about that. <laughs> we have been with, to so many hundreds of meetings, engagements and so on, that I'm sure you will forgive me for only once calling in at the wrong address. <laughs> we are calling in to see an important ambassador from an important EU member state in London. Instead of 27 Princess Gates, or whatever it was, we were taken to 27 Princess Streets. We didn't know at the time. Three of us were there, Dominic Searle from our London office, Daniel D'Amata from our Brussels office, and myself. I mean, I thought it rather odd there was no flag and there was no security at the door. <laughs> but having said that, my, my concerns were allayed somewhat when on pressing the buzzer to this grand mansion in an affluent part of the, of the city, we were allowed in with virtually no questions asked. <laughs> in a posh and beautiful hallway, we were greeted by a dog, a, a small cocker spaniel. <laughs> Thankfully, none of us were afraid of dogs. Eventually, the owner of the dog, wearing a bathrobe, walks down the stairs <laughs> to meet us. Either she was the, um, the ambassador underdressed for the meeting, <laughs> or certainly she was not the ambassador. On being informed that the deputy chief minister of Gibraltar was there for a meeting with Ambassador X of a member state, she then looked even more bewildered. <laughs> I thought, she said, you were the guys who are coming to fix a satellite TV. <laughs> Clearly, clearly, we were the ones who were underdressed for the, for the occasion. <laughs> but needless to say, we apologized, we turned around and we left and we managed to get to the real engagement in time. There have been other awkward moments too, plenty of them. But I mean, by, by far the strangest of them all was that time when we were accused of hacking into the European Parliament's IT system. An amendment to a resolution on Brexit concerning Gibraltar had been published and supported by a significant number of MEPs. Not unusual, except that it was published as though it had been introduced as a result of an agreement by the leaders of all the political groups in the European Parliament, including the European Partido Popular, supporting Gibraltar. So imagine their faces. The confusion lasted for about an hour. But still, this was enough to infuriate a particular Spanish MEP who later claimed the following in the press, and I'll quote in Spanish because that's how he said it. Nos dicen que es un error, pero no es verdad. Es una intoxicación y vamos a exigir responsabilidades. Es el juego sucio del lobby gibraltareño o de los británicos, o no sé de quién, pero van a caer cabeza. <laughs> There was, of course, no sabotage. No one was held responsible and no heads rolled. What the incident does show is the way Gibraltar is perceived by some in Spain. Capable of the worst evil, of the most wicked crimes, including computer hacking, and the implementers of underhand black schemes. These are the myths that we need to bust as we go forward into Brexit and the misconceptions which are held in Spain that we need to correct. It is not easy. It will take time, but we will get there in the end. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>